आई वी एम As China becomes more important to Australia's future and to that of the world, it follows that there will be more scrutiny of China, including the ways in which it seeks to exercise influence internationally. Those were the sounds of Chinese students protesting in Australia and the head of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade at Adelaide University. Welcome to the Pragati podcast. I'm Hamsani Hariharan and every week my co-host Pavan Srinath and I compare notes on policy, economics and international affairs. Recently, China issued a study abroad alert warning about attacks on Chinese students in Australia. In December, the Chinese embassy in Canberra issued a rare public safety warning for Chinese students living in the country. I sat down with Dr. Richard Rigby, who's an Australian diplomat, historian, and currently the executive director of the Australian National University China Institute at the Ricina Dialogues. I'd spoken to several Australians then and there was a wide array of views on India, China and the Indo-Pacific. What struck me about my conversation with Richard is that he described himself as a panda hugger. But through the conversation, he seemed to take a well-tempered, realist view of Australian foreign policy. Welcome to the show Richard. I'm going to dive straight in. 2017 marked 45 years of China and Australia's diplomatic relations. But I don't know how this relationship has progressed historically. Could you give me an idea of the sort of historical background to relations between both the countries? Well, we normalized relations with China at the end of 1972, about the time quite a lot of other western countries were were doing. and uh since that time overall it's become a very very important relationship and obviously for the first 10 years or so there wasn't a great deal that could actually be done because china was still uh not even fully emerged from the cultural revolution but so the big change really came in uh at the end of 19 well what happened at the end of 1978 when Deng Xiaoping announced opening and reform that then led set the the path that China has been following since then and enabled a much more substantive relationship to to develop go to far to start with it been largely about just recognizing strategic realities that uh, China was an important country that the people in Beijing with the people who ran it not the people in Taipei uh, and that was pretty much much it and there was also a bit of strategic stuff too in as much as uh China had a quite inimical relationship with the Soviet Union uh you know and over time there was a sort of a co- almost quasi alliance emerged with the United States we have a close alliance relationship with so it became you know less much less problematic than it used to be and this is from that australia which we so we're moving from a, a a position of considerable fear and concern of china you know through the through the 50s and and, and, and 60s you know one of the reasons the main reason why the government tried to explain to the australian people why we were involved in the vietnam war was because we tried to stop some sort of uh, southwards push by china which of course yeah. historically was, was nonsense yes. but at the time that that was how it was predicted so it was a big change you know the chinese had their cultural revolution our recognition of the prc in a sense was our cultural revolution coming to grips with our geography where geography starts to become a bit more important than history or at least equally as important as, as history this so was really opening a reform that uh, enabled the beginnings of a substantive economic relationship and sometimes younger chinese say to me that oh you know we know that australia really all you care about is is making money out of us you don't really care about it. so it's absolutely not true because when we normalized there was absolutely no money to be made out of china but china had no money you know was, yeah. the economy was in complete shambles it was an absolute basket case so it was only with the develop you know through the 1980s as the chinese economy started to pick up you know following an opening uh there was a growing demand for australian resources for iron ore and coal and natural gas and all these sort of things and in the process of developing that economic relationship you know lots of other ties were formed as well and i said there was also that particularly in 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 the 80s sort of the quasi uh, us china alliance so at that level too it was not 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 problematical of course what happened in 1989 
uh, was a bit of a, a, a reality check, a reminder, I suppose, that how not much China might be changing economically, it wasn't changing in terms of its fundamental nature a, as a party state, you know, led by the Chinese Communist Party. So that was a, it was a bit of a reality check. But, but the economy stuff had continued to grow so that by the early part of the 20th century, uh, it was really becoming very important. And then it exploded in 19, sorry, in 2002, the two-way trade was $10 billion, which all could be quite large. By 2012, it was 100 billion, so a tenfold increase in 10 years. Mm-hmm. And now it's about 160 billion. So it's given us the best terms of trade that we've ever had, meant that uh, along with Israel, we were the only OECD country that didn't go into recession after the uh, global financial crisis. Uh, So it's been hugely important. A report by the Sydney Morning Herald said that trade with Australia comprised 14% of China's overall foreign trade and that Chinese imports from Australia grew by 37% in 2017. In the U.S. under the current president, Donald Trump, and to a lesser extent in India, there's a lot of dialogue about the huge trade deficit that we have with China. If the Chinese-Australian trade had grown tenfold, did Australia also face a trade deficit? The trade is very much in our favour. Oh, okay. That's... Because of the nature of the trade being okay. largely resource-based. All right, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, the... China's rise in, in wealth and power and influence uh, has been increasingly making people realize that you know, it's not just a great opportunity for economic engagement, but the, the broader implications are, are going to be, already are, very, very considerable. And in fact, I think what we're seeing is now the end of the, for us, rather comfortable Asia-Pacific that we lived with from the defeat of Japan, yeah, you know, yeah. right, right up until the last last decade or so, where basically, uh, you know, the United States and its allies made the rules. It was sort of our world in a way, and yeah. and, and of course, looking at it in retrospectively, in historical terms, that really was very much a flash in the pan, uh, and the normality for most of human history has been for China, like India to be a really hugely substantial, whether you call it, I mean, not a country, obviously, in terms of modern state, but, you know, this sort of cultural, political entity uh, was was very, very big. So in a way, we're moving back to, you know, what what was more normal. Uh, But it's not necessarily all that comfortable. (laughs) And, and, And while, you know, we can be very comfortable about the rise of India, uh, because really largely of the nature of, of, of the Indian state, with, with China as a party state led by the Chinese Communist Party, it, it, it means there are aspects of, of, of China that we can't feel completely relaxed about. And I'm, I say this as somebody who's generally seen to be a, a bit of a panda hugger, which I would, I would absolutely de- deny, <laughs> you know, but so even, even I can see that you know, things are changing and change is inevitable. Uh, but not necessarily, you know, hundred percent, you know, a, a good and rosy. So this is a new reality that we have to deal with, and in some aspects of this reality uh, that have been causing concern about certain aspects of China's international behaviour, in particular for us, the South China Sea. Now we don't take any position on the on the territorial claims at all, but you know, we, we as a maritime state, a state that depends a great deal on international trade. Uh, acceptance of globally accepted rules are really very, very important. You know, again, as, as a middle power, you know, it's not, we're not going to be able to deal with this by throwing our weight around militarily. So we, we really think it's nice if people have rules and they stick to them. You know? Now, the Chinese, of course, say they are sticking to the rules. They have different interpretations of what, of what those rules are. But, you know, we, we, we can debate about that forever. But certainly, developments in South China Sea have caused growing concern. Ditto, not quite so much, but some degree developments in East China Sea as well, around Diaoyu Senkakus. Yes. Uh, and again, we don't take any position on that at all. In fact, my personal view is that Chinese have a slightly better case than the Japanese case. But that's not the point. You know, it's, it's how these differences are, 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 are addressed and, and articulated. 
Now, again, against against the background of China's rise having been enormously beneficial for Australia, you know, particularly in economic terms, um, we've also now, in, in recent years, they're beginning to see the growing impact of, of China in certain aspects of Australia's domestic situation. Uh, and some of this, again, is very good. You know, most Australian universities will collapse tomorrow were not for the vast number of Chinese students yeah. currently studying in Australia. Are Chinese students the highest number? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. It's somewhere between 60 and 90,000. And a number of you... Our Australian National University, because we're rather research-heavy, don't depend quite so much on uh, undergraduates or undergraduates going overseas, but some of the big universities in Sydney and Melbourne are really enormous now. Indian students are the next great, greatest number after, after Chinese, but the Chinese are still right out there. So that's, that's again, very, very beneficial. Um, uh, tourism, you know, Chinese tourism now is well over a million uh, per annum, moving up towards two million. Again, that's terrific, although, of course, it brings, brings its own sort of challenges. How, how do you deal with this? How do you, you know, how does the tourist industry uh, adapt? But at the same time, we've, uh, yeah, uh, again, Investment, you know, Australia is a country because because we're a very large country, uh, resource-rich country, but with a very small population. Uh, we we have always needed very significant overseas investment to help us develop the country. Uh, start with obviously from Britain and then subsequently from the United States, so uh, Japan, but more recently China. And China's investment over the last four or five years now has been growing faster than any other country's investment. Having said that, it's still really chicken feed compared to the investment of the, 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 old, the old investors. Uh, but, you know, people notice it because it's new. And it also takes place in areas which I think many, many countries regard as being rather sensitive. Um, you know, uh, land, you know, resources and energy, and increasingly, well, also, you know, it's not so huge, but it has a big impact on people who live in sort of the big cities, especially Sydney. Wealthy Chinese buying up property and sending, you know, property prices through the roof. And of course, the economists would say this is good because it leads to the overall, overall uh, rise, in, rise in value. But if you're, if, if you're a parent worried about if your children are ever going to be able to afford to buy a house in the same city, you know, it, it becomes much more, more difficult. And then there have been some more obvious things such as attempts to influence some uh, politicians, uh, Chinese community groups, which have hitherto been largely, uh, if they were aligned with anybody other than Australia, they, they tend to be more influenced by, by Hong Kong, by maybe the Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia, people from Taiwan, uh, 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 apart from the much older Chinese community, which really goes back to the gold rush days of the 19th century. Now, inevitably, Chinese communities are, are, are in, increasingly composed of people who have been born in or spent a significant part of their life in the People's Republic of China. And so naturally, uh, mentally, in terms of values, ideas, they, they are more aligned with a PRC way of thinking than, than has hitherto been the case. And so we see, you know, community groups beginning to organise, like, you know, supporting China's position on the South China Sea. Well, that's all right. We're a free country. We're glad to do it. But it's, but it's new. And there are ways of doing that legitimate and the ways of doing that perhaps a, a bit less, less legitimate. Uh, sometimes it's our own fault. You know, I mentioned the I issues of uh, seeking to influence politicians. Um, I mean, most Australians probably didn't realise until very recently that it is actually not illegal for foreign countries to make significant uh, donations to political parties. And you mentioned right at the beginning this question of legislation. And yes, we are now finally putting legislation through Parliament to ensure that that is no longer possible. Now, you know, that was an own goal, if, if, if you like. Uh, uh, and, and we are seeking to address this. Um, uh, similarly, although I talked about how beneficial to Australian universities large Chinese student presence was, you know, it's not been without its problems. Again, you know, understandably, these kids tend to be pretty patriotic. Uh, they hear a lecturer saying something or they see something in a textbook they don't like. They're going to make a noise about it. They're going to make a fuss about it. It's okay up to a point, 
But, you know, I think you know, they also need to learn that in the sort of country that we have, like the sort of country you have here in India, a wide variety of views is absolutely legitimate. And just because you don't agree or just because your government takes that position, but that doesn't give you the right to try to close down the conversation. In September 2017, the BBC reported that Chinese students in Australia had raised issues when lecturers did not conform to the One China policy by referring to Taiwan and Hong Kong as separate countries or by using maps that China did not approve of. Uh, you'd mentioned that Chinese students sometimes found certain things objectionable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're a teacher, you teach yeah, at one of yeah. uh, possibly Australia's yes, yeah, largest yeah, yeah. school of public uh, foreign yeah, policy. Yeah. Uh, has something happened in your personal I have experience? never encountered that. Oh. And, and, and the, num- the number of those instances are actually quite small. When you look at the tens of thousands of Chinese students, there are three or four cases that have got into the newspaper. But there are, there, I mean, there, there, there is one particular lecturer at our, at our university who has, she said that she has felt uncomfortable dealing with, dealing with some issues, particularly sensitive, you know, Taiwan. Um, um, uh, I've certainly been aware of, you know, giving some lectures on modern Chinese history that the, the view that I've been giving is not necessarily one that quite a lot of students will necessarily agree with. Uh, for instance, when I talk about what to me were the remarkable achievements of the Republic of China under the nationalists before the Japanese invasion, it would basically lay the way over for the communist victory. Um, but I haven't any, had anybody raise objections with me. They might mutter about behind my back this terrible old reaction here to see the gears. What's this white guy thinking? What does he know about China anyway? You know. But but I have never encountered that personally. The BBC had also reported the rise of an anti-China sentiment on college campuses. This is worrying because Chinese students are the largest chunk of international students in Australia. A Global Times article in December 2017 points out that Australians have done little to help Chinese students with cultural exchange or to integrate. And again, precisely because of the, the, the absolute size of the Chinese student population, it means that they don't necessarily have much of an Australian experience. You know, Again, I don't think this is unique to the Chinese. Any, any diaspora population, when it gets above a certain state, they tend to spend most of their time amongst themselves. So you know, they might learn how to, you know, they might get their MBAs or, or become better accountants. Or that sort of, but probably they don't actually learn all that much about you know, life in an open democratic society because they spend most of their time in their own circles. This is another thing we have to work out how to, how to, how, how to address. And because a, n- a number of these issues have come together, and then of course we've recently put our, chi- our foreign policy white paper, that actually spends quite a bit of time talking about the importance of our bilateral relationship with China, but nevertheless puts this in the context of the, our overall continued commitment to our alliance relationship with the United States, uh, multiple references to, to the need for a rules-based global order, uh, there are things in there that, you know, clearly at least some of our Chinese interlocutors would, would rather were not there. Yeah. Yeah. But they are going to be there, and, that, and that's all there is to it. So all these things coming together in a relatively short period of time have led to a certain led to a sort of shrillness and sharpness. Sometimes statements by Australians, including politicians, certainly some uh, Chinese uh, media commentary, the Chinese embassy occasionally says things that... Um, I think don't, are not very effective in achieving their goal. If they're trying to make Australians understand the importance of the relationship, there's, there's a role for being a little bit less shrill. In December 2017, the Australian government introduced a new legislation about espionage and foreign interference because of reports of the Chinese government providing political funding to some Australian political parties. In episode 30, Rory Medcalf had characterized this intrusive influence in the internal affairs of other states as sharp power. And that's precisely the process that we're going through at, at, at the moment. You know, Australia's, when I was, well, I spent a lot of, quite a lot of my childhood in England, but I was Australian, I was born in Australia, Australia's my home. Uh, and, you know, right through most of my time as an undergraduate back in the 60s, I can't believe it was such a long time ago, but anyway, it was, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, Australia was still, uh, you know, we, we were only just moving away from the white Australia policy. So it was a very, very, uh, not just white, but Anglo society. And in the years since then, we've become a, 
they, oh, by and large, very successful uh, multicultural country. And, and it's been re- remarkably smooth, I, I think. Uh, you know, there have been a few little little issues, but, um, but by and large, uh, it's been very, very successful. But one of the reasons why it's been successful, I think, is because you know, the great majority of uh, migrants to Australia have... They're in Australia because they actually wanted to come to Australia. It's not just that they wanted to get away from where they're getting away from, but they wanted to come to Australia. Now, there are some elements of the Middle Eastern community, I have to be very careful I address this, but, you know, who, who actually want to keep element, you know, some, some people want to talk about Sharia yeah, law yeah, and all that sure. sort of stuff. Yeah. And that can be a bit problematical, you know, who don't, don't, don't like our sort of society. You know. But by and large, so the vast majority do. But, uh, you know, at this period when, when things are changing both externally and, and, and domestically, um, it, it's, it's making people, more people, I think, think about these things in the past. You know, again, China-Australia relations for most of the period since normalization was handled, I think, pretty well by elites on both sides, you know, a few hundred people, maybe if, if, even if that, you know, foreign ministries, you know, prime ministers, ministers, you know, a few academics, you know, some good jokes. And whereas now, I mean, in, 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 in Australia, there's no getting away from China. You know, you go to the shops, whether you're buying a pair of socks or buying a computer, it's made in China. You know, the major uh, cities in, 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 in downtown now in Australia, Sydney and Melbourne, you see Chinese people wherever you go. And that's, you know, very good, but it's also... Uh, new and so it's no longer a matter of elites it's a matter for pretty much every, any, anybody who lives in the country now is aware that things are changing and so how we manage that change is is a challenge and I think it's a, cha- it's, it's, it's a challenge that we cannot simply address on our own and that's why you know we're spending more time now talking to friends in, in, in Japan in India and, and elsewhere or somewhere in Vietnam in Indonesia and so on, as well as our traditional allies in the United States, about what precisely is, is happening, the impact of the rise of China, to what to, you know, nobody's going to try to hold China down. The Chinese sometimes talk about, you know, being, being in circle, being constrained in one way. No one would do that. I mean, we've got huge interests in China's continuing, you know, to, to succeed. And we hope that over time, you know, the Chinese society also becomes more open and more relaxed. And sorry, that is another issue. At, at, under the current leadership in China, you know, there, there clearly has been a good deal of tightening domestically. So at the, at, at, at the time when President Xi is saying, and, you know, very much to his credit, he is saying in forums like Davos and Guayanto, talking about the importance of globalization and openness, that's great, especially given the current you know, situation in the United States in the White House specifically. Yeah. Uh, it's great that we have a, have, a, have a leader talking about this, but it's happening at the same time as <laughs> within China itself. We see this ideological tightening, domestic tightening, and, and you know, there is a contradiction there. And, and it, again, it makes people feel a bit less comfortable about the precise nature of, of China uh, than might be the case uh, were things perhaps a bit more open and a bit more more relaxed in, in China itself. So I think, you know, we are in a period of great stir, great flux. We need to be talking to each other. We, I think we need to avoid, you know, looking uh, as if we are and somehow trying to form some great anti-China coalition, which would be a dumb thing to do and it wouldn't, wouldn't work anyway. Uh, and we in Australia can have, do have to be particularly careful, I think, because... I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the white Australia policy. Now, thank God we've moved a long way away from that. But if you like, that's was sort of the original sin of the creation of when Australia federated in, in 1900, 1901. You know, when the first bits of legislation passed was this white Australia legislation. So we have to be very careful if, in addressing activities, Chinese activities in Australia. And by Chinese, I think we have to be very careful to say, activities by the Chinese government, by the Chinese Communist Party, we need to be very careful to distinguish between that and Chinese people generally. Uh, again, that very easily just flows over into a, into a more sort of xenophobic, might start anti-Chinese, then become more generally you know, anti-Asian, whatever. We have to be very, very sensitive to, to, to those issues. And I think you know, there have been instances of people in the Chinese community 
who have seen some you know, <coughs> statements by some Australian politicians recently as being directed against Chinese in general, rather than certain activities yeah. that are now in the process of being made illegal. Moving on from domestic to international affairs, issues like the quadrilateral or the quad grouping have become hot topics again. Even at the Raisina Dialogues, there was a panel discussion where the naval chiefs of the four quad countries spoke about order in the Indo-Pacific. I, I think it's fine that uh, uh, India, United States, Japan and Australia talk about things together. And obviously uh, an important thing we all talk about is the impact of the rise of China because that is affecting everybody. But I... I I, I myself would prefer it to be something which took place at officials' levels, uh, preferably around some other sort of meetings. I think overly formalizing it and giving it too high a profile could be seen as being provocative. And, and, and um, it's not necessarily bad to be provocative sometimes, but provocative and, and, and not effective at the same time, possibly even leading to precisely the opposite of what you need. So I think it requires a, a degree of sort of delicacy. And I think we should also therefore be you know, looking at other groupings as well. You know, sometimes we can, let's bring in the Indonesians or let's bring in the Vietnamese or, or, or you know, where does Singapore been? And what about the Koreans? If we're having the tournament with, with, the, with the Japanese, you know, why not the Koreans and so on? So it can become more of a general conversation. Uh, amongst, and, and then another thing, I think... While we're doing that sort of thing, we also should be seeking to optimize opportunities of working together with the Chinese. Uh, so they they see that, you know, while there are some areas which we may disagree, there are other areas in which we, 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 we agree. And the other thing about the quads, of course, is that while we're all very interested in talking, talking through the implications of China's rise, and in, you know, there's a degree of edging there, obviously. At the same time, we all have very important relationships with China. China. Yeah, uh, but but the nature of those relationships are not necessarily exactly the same. You know, yeah, very different across continents. Very, very different across continents. Very different across you know, because the, 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 you are you are the only one of the quads that actually well, you 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 have direct land borders which yeah. which are problematic. The, the, the Japanese don't have a land border, but they have an issue with the, in the East China Sea. We don't have anything like that. We have general issues of principle in the South China Sea, ditto with the United States. Um, China is our number one trading partner, and we have an economic advantage. You know, the balance is in our favor. It's ditto for the United States, but for the United States, it's not. the balance is not in their favor. You know? yeah. And then again, for three of us, Japan, United States, uh, Australia, Although we talk about the Indo-Pacific, and that's a very important concept, nevertheless, we, we tend to be concentrating our, our, our principal on, 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 on the Pacific. That, that, that's right, including the South China Sea. Whereas for India, obviously, it's the Indian Ocean first. South China Sea is interesting because arguably it could be fought, fought, I mean, it, it flows into the Malacca Straits and India. And there's, you know, let's not forget, if the Chinese talk about the, the validity of their territorial claims in the South China Sea being based on history... We shouldn't forget, particularly coming from the part of India, you come from the Chola dynasty were actually very active in yeah, the South China was. Sea, you know. I, I think uh, they established contacts with the Song dynasty. Yeah, back and, and, and Tan Sun Sun, who's a friend of mine, really, really, you know, bright, I think originally Bengali scholar of uh, history of Indo-China relations, but he, he argues that some of those early Chinese names for certain features on China are actually Chinese transliterations of, of, of Tamil, words, yeah. Tamil, Tamil words from, yeah. from, from, from the Tola, you know, so <laughs> it's... <laughs> That is interesting. So it, it, it's certainly complex. Yes, it is. There are yeah. so many layers yeah. to this. And, and I don't think it's beyond the wit of, uh, <laughs> of mortal man or woman to, uh, to solve these issues. But I think we are going through a period of great change. The international order is complex and changing. But where do lines and limits lie when it comes to power? I'm going to quote Paul Kennedy, who's the author of The Rise and Fall of Great Powers. He said... The beginning of wisdom in humans as well as international affairs was knowing when to stop. And I think that's a good note to end this episode as well. You can listen to the Pragati podcast on the IVM podcast app or wherever you listen to your podcast. And of course, on thinkpragati.com. We'll be back next week with your policy fix.
The Pragati Podcast is an IVM production and if you like our show you can also check out their other shows like Geek Fruit a show with pop culture geeks Tejas Jishnu and Dinkar where they discuss news and views from the world of science fiction cinema television and video games new episodes out every monday on ivmpodcast.com the ivm podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts He bends down to test the warm water for his bath. He comes here to quench his thirst for a hot shower and some podcasts. You can witness how he enjoys having other people talk about cool stuff in his bathroom. Indeed, it helps him with his loneliness. You can find more of his pieces on ivmpodcast.com. Your one-stop destination where you can check out the coolest Indian podcasts. Happy listening.